Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road to the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and whether the pub is serving too many people too much uh, absinthe. At a corner table by the fire are three people. One of them is saying that his ear kind of hurts, but he can't quite figure out why. And that's me, uh, Matthew Melema, and welcome to Believe to See. We are a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Here at Believe to See, we explore the relationship between faith, art, and storytelling. Our goal is to help you connect the great story, the great stories, in our own stories in order to understand what it means to live with a Christian imagination. Well, for those of you who have been listening to Believe to See for even a little bit of time, you will know that we really love middle grade literature. I happen to write it, for instance, and some of the great friends of the podcast, uh, S.D. Smith, for example, write it as well. So we're all about that. But only the original, the hardcore fans may remember that at a time, there was a time when this podcast was also all about Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, my former co-host, Marcus Robinson, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, I should probably clarify, uh, by rest in peace, the, the, our dearly departed Marcus Robinson is uh, in Portland. He's not dead. I should probably stop phrasing it that way. Um, but our dearly departed Marcus uh, loved Vincent Van Gogh so, so much and would always talk about him. So as you can imagine, when we had a book proposal come in that had to do with middle grade and Vincent Van Gogh, well, obviously we're all about that, uh, in this book is written by Carolyn Leilaglu, and it is, well, I'll let her explain it in just a bit, but uh, let me tell you a little bit about Carolyn herself. She is actually the granddaughter of art collectors, the daughter of an art teacher, and a homeschooling mom, and as you will see, all of those will be very relevant to what she's uh, to what she's doing. I'll let her explain the rest herself, but first let me bring in my co-host here, Mandy Hauk. Mandy, how are you doing? Okay. Any particular? I'm good. You scared me a little. You scared me a little mentioning absent. You are. I'm, I'm terrified of did you, absent. Did Did uh, Moulin Rouge scare you away? <laughs> the The Green Fairy. <laughs> oh well. I haven't even seen Moulin Rouge. I don't know. I just well. I don't think it's toxic anymore. Absent. Like it was back in the day, and that's why a lot of famous artists went insane. Oh, anymore. Um, wasn't. I think it's fair to say Vincent well, I, Van Gogh yeah, did not use well. it in a healthy way. But um, anywho, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mandy, thank you so much for joining me here. And uh, now let's bring in our guest. Like I said, Carolyn Leilaglu, how are you doing? Welcome to the table. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. And to be uh, fair, Van Gogh did eat his own paints sometimes. Okay, well, and so that could have been more to do with. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of like that elementary kid who ate paste. That's interesting. Yeah, that that's paint probably back a little in the safer. Day. Okay, now <laughs> I'm wondering what, what. Okay, so what yeah. happened to my classmate Sheldon, who used to always eat paste? Maybe he's a famous artist now. So, so what you're know. saying, Carolyn, is that th <laughs> there are a number of different independent reasons why Vincent Van Gogh may not have lasted too long on this earth. Okay, well. He, he left some good paintings yes, before yeah. he went, but and we'll get to that here soon. But uh, first of all, uh, Carolyn, of thank you so much for joining us. Um, your book, Beneath the Swirling Sky, is it out? Is it just out? Is it about to be out? Where do we stand on that line? <laughs> Well, it depends on when this podcast release, but it comes out on <laughs> on September 12th, uh, 2023. So um, hopefully it's either by the time this release is out or close to being out. Um, so it's super exciting super right exciting. now. Yeah, so listeners, the, uh, the depending stuff, on so. when this uh, this posts, you'll either be able to yeah. buy it or at least like pre-order. You do a bookmark. You, 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 all, you all know what to do. But um, Carolyn, I, I mentioned sure. that this is middle grade and it involves Van Gogh. Um, there are a lot of different directions that can go from there. So why don't you give us a quick rundown? Give, give us your elevator pitch for the story. <laughs> 
Okay, so the main character of the story is named Vincent after Van Gogh, but is it takes place in modern times. So Vincent is a 12-year-old kid who has given up on painting after a bad experience. But then he learns that his family are the last of the Restorationists. They're a secret society with the ability to travel through art and the duty to protect it. So when his uh, little sister disappears into the starry night, uh, he has no choice but to oh. go rescue her along with his cousin Georgia. I have to say, I don't know if I would want to be rescued out of the starry night. <laughs> well, it's not just that she's in the starry night. Um, I figured there's some bad, bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> so she really does need rescuing. Yeah. <laughs> when I saw starry night at, where would I have seen it? Somewhere in New York, right? It's at the MoMA, the MoMA. in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was a long time uh -huh. ago, but I went there with my sister and my sister is like a goer, like she's like, P -chew, P -chew, and she absorbs things and I just get stuck. And I literally, I lost her because I lost time because I was just like staring at Starry Night. Vincent Van Gogh is one of my absolute favorites. Marcus and I used to bond him. <laughs> but man, Starry yeah. Night. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's talk. Yeah, uh, first of all, that was an excellent elevator pitch. I can tell you are in the ramp up to the launch. You, you, that was very yes. well done. Um, <laughs> but, but second of all, so how did this concept first Thank come you. to you? Did you start with painting then add a story or did you start with the story and add painting or what? what tell us the story behind that. That's a great question. So I was actually in a in a webinar where an author was leading us through some exercises and she told us to imagine the most magical place from our childhood. And for me, it was my grandparents' house. And their house was kind of like a museum, like if a museum was like super overstuffed. <laughs> so they had paintings on every wall. There were like bronze sculptures and then like little knickknacks from around the world and all, all sorts of stuff. Um, but then upstairs, they kind of had creepy upstairs. But there was a room that just had stacks of paintings that they didn't have room for that they, that they had bought. And so I was thinking about that. And I'm like, what if, you know, what if you could travel into a painting? And what if you were in a house like this and found this room full of paintings? Uh, you know, what what would the story be? And uh, of course, you know, Starry Night is my favorite. So I just had to, you know, break the rules a little bit to have that there. You know, we, you would get one like suspension of disbelief thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there's reasons that it, that it happens to be there at, at that time. But um, yeah, so that's the first painting that um, that Vincent and, and his sister go into. Mandy, I was I was gesturing. Oh, go ahead, Mandy. And th this is. A, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, this is the first of a series, right? I noticed that. So I'm it is. Excited. Yeah, it's going to be a three book series. That's awesome. It, it actually kind of made me think of the Cornelia Funke. Um, series mm -hmm. Inkwell. Um, it's a little different. I mean, first of all, it's not paintings, it's books. And also I think in Inkwell, the characters come out, right? Except the white. Yes. In yeah. Story. Yeah. But that, that was what I thought of when I read right. your um, uh, bio and the description of the book was Cornelia Funke and the Inkwell. Books. Yeah, and there's some newer books, the Book Wanderers series that does a similar thing for a little bit younger audience. Oh, that's good. Um, where where characters are coming out of books and then characters go into books. <laughs> so this is a similar thing, but with but paintings. with paintings, and I love that because yeah. to me, what I was also a and I was homeschooled. Mom, by the hey, way. look at all of us. Um, awesome. Not anymore. There. Yay! Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my girls are in their twenties now, so um, they loved the art curriculum that we did and um I I just remember thinking I'm, I was jealous of them because I remember when I was a kid I didn't get to learn that stuff as a kid but I loved that stuff and it's funny because sometimes I I was a psychology major and I every now and then I'm like totally should have done art history or something because I'm just fascinated um by it and it was just really that was like my mini art history lesson was teaching my girls. <laughs> That's cool. Um, yeah. They, they, yeah. My mom was an art history major yeah. and was an art teacher for a while before I was born. And so I feel like I grew up just kind of absorbing some random stuff. And it wasn't like, here, you need to learn this or right. whatever. But, you know, I knew that there was a Manet and a Monet, even if I couldn't have told the difference necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, I, that's such a lack because even when they mm. have – art in the schools I don't think it's so much art history um as mm. you know and it shouldn't be it shouldn't seem so um elusive it shouldn't be elite it's 
Yeah, you know? it's it's for everyone, it right? I mean, as as young, that's as why we possible. have museums. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I love that the um, children who are going to have this book read to them are going to be like, oh, "Wait, that's a real painting!" You know, mm-hmm. how exciting! Yeah, I have a whole list in the back of the books of um, of what the paintings are, where they're located, um, and then the paintings that the bad guys have oh. are actual oh. real paintings as well that are stolen and have never been recovered. Oh, girl! So, oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> I don't have little kids, but my birthday is right before your book comes out. So I'm going to treat myself right. and buy that book for I, myself. I had another question Perfect. that was totally on point, but Carolyn, you you sidetracked me with, with saying something interesting just now. Um, so in your list of stolen artwork, do you have that Rembrandt, that seascape that was stolen from that museum in Boston? That's the one. And there's actually like a really pivotal moment of the story that happens in that painting. Oh, that's great. (laughs) So it it was kind of, uh, it was such a God thing actually, because, you know, I wanted to confine, Mm. confine myself to like the rules that I set up for the world. Like, you know, the, the way you get from painting to painting is like, there's a corridor that connects each artist's paintings, right? So if you want to, you can go from that artist's painting to a different painting by that artist, you come out in a museum, you have to switch artists, you know, whatever. So it makes things complicated and a little research heavy on my end. But then, you know, I was like, I, the bad guys have to have paintings that are real Mm -hmm. and that are known to be stolen and not recovered. And then I learned about the, the Gardner heist actually through another middle grade book that I had read. Um, I think it was the Rembrandt conspiracy, Mm. which is also fantastic. Uh, no fantastical elements there in that one though, but it's a lot of fun. Um, so I learned about the Gardner heist and like could not, I've like read multiple books on it now, listen to podcasts, you know, watch documentaries. Yeah. Um, and it's just kind of a fascinating mystery. Um, but yeah, that's one of the main paintings that was stolen. And it, it felt like such a God thing. Like I found out about this painting and it just kind of worked for what I needed in the story and just kind of made the perfect, like crucial key moment. Well, I um, can't wait either. That I can't yeah. So, to, so just so you know why, why, Decided to name that one. Uh, Netflix, this is probably one of the documentaries you watch. Netflix has a documentary called This is a Robbery, which is about the theft of that painting, among others, yes. from that, that museum in oh. Boston. And uh, listeners, this is okay. a very important historical painting. Nice. Like it, It's Rembrandt's only seascape. Um, so it's, uh, so it, it's historically yeah. important, and it's mm-hmm. never shown up. This, this uh, robbery happened, I think, in the mid-90s. Really interesting story. So... I'm very glad it's going to get a second life in your book. Um, And that leads me into the other thing that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, You talked about how the art came into the book, and that totally makes sense with with what you described about growing up. My question is, uh, why does, why is Vincent Van Gogh kind of your, your first through point in there, right? Because obviously the the title of your book seems to be a take on a starry night when the character's named Vincent. So what about Vincent Van Gogh sort of made him stand out as like the entry point for you? He's just kind of always been my favorite. Um, I I remember even when I was like in fifth grade, my mom, I I was doing a, I had to write a biography for school, a report. And my mom was like, why don't you do Van Gogh? Which is kind of like weird for a little kid to to do. And I had some things explained to me kind of strangely, but. um, Who did he send a year to? Wait, what? It's not all PG, but um, you know. (laughs) <laughs> his his girlfriend yeah. <laughs> that's what I was told that that word meant but um yeah so uh yeah so I was kind of always aware of Van Gogh for since I was little and um but when I remember really getting into him was in college and I um had a professor that took a group of us to um it was the LA County Museum of Art had a exhibit of Van Gogh's paintings I went and there and I was there I was not oh. a child at the time. Well, I was in college. Yeah, I, I think so I quite a child. My, <laughs> I took my toddler and had to carry her around like that, like above nice. my head. Nice. So I, I got to see Starry Night for the first time there. Mm. Um, and I also got to see Wheat Filled with Crows. And I feel like that painting, um, maybe even more than Starry Night, was like, I feel like I saw it from across the room and it was like a gut punch. It was just so powerful. And both of them are a lot smaller mm. than you expect. Totally. Like you see the posters. Starry and Night is so They're poster small. size. Yeah. They're both, both pretty mm-hmm. small. Um, so, but they're so powerful. And what I love about Starry Night is that um, it 
it mm. shows not the way nature is, but the way nature feels, mm. right? You, if you if you go out on a, a cloudless night and you're in, out in the country and you can actually see the Milky Way, it feels like that, like that painting feels. So um, I just have always loved that painting. And then also what I love about Van Gogh is, you know, even though he, he certainly <laughs> was a mixed bag in a lot of ways, um, I do think he loved the Lord and, and really... Um, in his own way, right, tried to connect to God and had a lot of like deep, profound thoughts. And um, and in, in that painting, particularly, it's very interesting because the church is darkened. All the light, all the houses have lights except for the church, mm-hmm. which I guess makes sense if you really think about it. Like no one's at the church, but people are at their homes. But and the the sky is what's so brightly lit up. Um, and I think that Van Gogh really experienced God through nature in that way. He had been kind of burned by the church in a lot of ways. So um, anyways, it kind of gave me an opportunity to introduce some themes of spirituality early on in the book. Um, there in the, the Rembrandt painting that comes to a head a little bit more, but I'm able to like introduce it a little bit earlier. It's, it's a book by a Christian publisher that's meant to be kind of a crossover book. It's going to be, you know, at Barnes and Noble and everywhere, kind of like Wingfeather Saga. So yeah, I'm kind so of excited. Something else I was that. thinking about in, in, in this in coming to your same conclusion that uh, Van Gogh's the perfect like uh, 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 entry point for folks is something about Van Gogh. I think it might be his distinctive style, but he has one of these rare statuses where folks who know a whole lot about art love him. You know, like the the art history professors, the art students, and folks who don't otherwise know a lot about art love him. Right? Like you'll see Starry Night on like. Uh, you know, uh, cell phone covers or like on computer bags or, or something like that. And you really won't see that for any other artist, certainly not an artist who lived, you know, like two, 300 years ago. Uh, did, did either of you get the chance to go to that uh, like immersive Van Gogh experience where you like in a room and they, they project the Van Gogh? Uh, Carolyn, you're nodding yes. I, I did, I yeah, mean, because um, I, I, mean, I kind research. of felt like I had to because I'd already <laughs> <laughs> written the book. I was working on revisions at that time, I think. I went last um, December or January, I think, with my son, who's who's an artist, and um, he's he's 16. And um, we really enjoyed it. It was, mm-hmm. it was great. Um, <laughs> it's not the same as seeing the painting in real life, though. <laughs> yeah, I, my daughter, Bethany, my younger daughter, who is very much like me and, like, taste and um things that we love and don't love or whatever she went to it and I was all ready to go and she was like you know I don't she didn't think that I would like it as much not not enough for the cost of entrance I suppose but it was was also right after I think she went to see it right after my husband and I got back from Amsterdam and I oh well oh too good for it I see I I saw the real thing I don't need these projections (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> even cooler than that was across the street with one brand's actual house but we can talk about that another oh time. wow but um yeah so That's i cool. yeah my daughter went to that and she, and she liked it um she said it was a really interesting way to experience the art um mm-hmm. but i guess she knows i'm a little cranky so maybe I yeah wouldn't so uh so me and uh me and danielle my wife went but, and i i really enjoyed it and so did danielle so i will say it is the sort of thing where it took a while to sort of get used to it you know kind of like you're you're getting in a really hot hot tub takes your body a while to get used to it. it's that sort of thing where you're you're sitting there you have the music <laughs> it's going all around you so it takes a while to get the flow but once you do i thought it was really cool and I will yeah. say related mm-hmm. to that, first mm-hmm. of all, it's interesting that, again, of all the artists we're picking, it's Van Gogh, right? I can't think, you know, like, we all love Monet and Manet, okay. who, you know, we all get them, but we're not going to go to like, oh, it's Manet. No, it's Van Gogh. And again, the the folks there, it seemed like a pretty <laughs> yeah. broad swath of folks. You didn't get the, the, the feeling it was just like the art uh, Illuminati there. It was just regular people who would, Go look at the Van Gogh paintings and buy a Van Gogh t-shirt in the gift shop. I, he has that power that I don't think any, maybe someone could name another artist, but I, I think he's the primary mm. one just in, in sort of our cultural zeitgeist. Yeah, well, and my yeah. husband, I mean, he appreciates art, but it doesn't move him necessarily the way, like, um, he's very mathematical. Matt knows him. He's an engineer and... Um, but oh, Van Gogh, he just loves Van Gogh. And like, we went to a lot of museums when we went to Europe. 
of course. Um, but he <laughs> was way more like zoned in and emotionally moved. And I really think it's like what mm. you said. It's true of Starry Night. And I think it's true just of Van Gogh in general. He he paints what how things feel. Like uh, his, mm. um, just even looking at all of his self-portraits, it's like, it can be so heartbreaking because you can kind of see how he thought of himself and how he was feeling. And I just think he has this magical way of connecting to the person who's looking at the painting with no words, Mm -hmm. with literally hundreds of years between us. He didn't speak the language we speak. Like it's really, um, it's miraculous. I think what he does with paint. I mean, you can tell he really poured his soul into those Mm -hmm. paintings. He wasn't trying to be pretentious and, you know, whatever. He was just really, truly seeking to express art for its own sake. And um, I think that's why his paintings retain such power. And he ignored. And thank you to his sister-in-law, Johanna Bonger, for saving all of his paintings. Like, we wouldn't have them if it weren't for her. Thank goodness. (laughs) But yeah, and I mean, and for him to ignore the critics... Um, Mm. and just do what he knew, what came from his heart, even though it wasn't commercially. Yeah. And uh, so to that point very briefly, so Van Gogh, as as has been well established now, had a very unorthodox and interesting life. So he'd bounce around from career to career, get really into something, failed, go into something else. So he got into painting pretty late in life. And when he first started, he, he took like a drawing class and he was so bad that his professors very haughtily suggested he go back and take a children's drawing class. So he goes from that to his paintings within the course of a few years. So it's just an incredible story. Um, but Carolyn, you, you mentioned something that, that sort of stuck out to me, and that's uh, you know creating art for art's sake. And that, that got me to thinking about some of the themes that you were hoping to convey with this story. So... Let's go through them. It sounds like that is going to be something that you want to convey with this with this book. Well, first of all, what, what is that message, and well, why do you think it's uh, so important to to share with middle grade readers? <laughs> yeah, uh, where to start? Um, so one of one of the big things that I I think about is. Um, you know, who we are made in God's image, right? And um, Dorothy Sayers, if you've read The Mind of the Maker, one of the things she posits is that when we're told in Genesis 3, I've, I'm bad with numbers, don't don't quote me on it. <laughs> uh, when we're told in Genesis that um, man and woman were made in God's image, the only thing we've been told about God to that point is that he is the creator. Mm-hmm. And so she says, you know, creativity is something that is innate in the image of God in us. Um and I think that's so important. And um, it's for kids, especially like middle grade readers, that age group, um, that's the age when kids are starting to realize like, oh, this drawing that I made of a unicorn, like my mom can't even tell what it is. And, you know, like what, I, what I'm seeing in my imagination is not like making it onto paper. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, I, I've never been like an, an artist. I don't have like, like a lot of dexterity, but I wanted to write since I was little. And, um, in about fifth grade, I quit and it wasn't because I didn't want to be an author anymore. It was because I was hard (laughs) and I didn't know if I was good enough. Right. I was one of those kids that was, um, was good at school and writing was not easy like school was. So I thought, Oh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not good at this. I can't do it. And I think a lot of kids are in that that same boat in that time period, time frame, right? They're saying, there's this thing that I want to do. And I think it's probably a call that God's placed on their heart, maybe even. It's part of who who they're meant to be. And they decide that they can't do it because it's hard or someone makes fun of them or whatever. And um, so I really want in this book to kind of say, hey, creativity is something that you, that's part of who you are. It's who who we're all meant to be. Yeah, so. there's a couple points that, that stick out to me about that. Uh, first of all, there's just the concept of trying something, even though you know you're going to be bad at it right away, right? And that is, like you said, mm. it, I think you really yeah. start to realize that sort of stuff once you get to like the middle grade levels, right? Later elementary school, going to middle school, it's when you start to kind of sort out mm-hmm. like, okay, what am I really good at? What's my thing? Am I an athlete? Am I a drama person? Blah, blah, blah. And that's when, you, like you said, 
when you're six and you draw a unicorn, you're, you're probably pretty happy with it. But when you're 13 and drawing a unicorn, you can probably tell the difference. I, I know I can see that with my kids. Uh, both me and my wife have uh, kind of perfectionist tendencies. Uh, so we're see, already seeing that in them. So what we are trying to do to model this is we are <laughs> picking up different forms of art that we don't know how to do and that we're bad at. Oh, Mandy, you'd be so proud of me. I started whittling in the past couple of weeks. Yeah. Oh. Yep. I love it. So I, I have, yeah, I please, ordered please my little kit. I have, I have my gloves, so I'm all careful. I've only, I've only cut myself once so far. Um, so, oh, so I'm doing it, and I enjoy it, even though I know, objectively, I'm not good at it. I'm just enjoying being creative, even though I'm bad at it. And I think that's a, a good place to be in. Yeah. yeah. What I always tell my kids when they're like, I can't draw people or I can't draw horses mm -hmm. or I can't do this thing on the piano or whatever. I always tell them you get good at what you do. So if you if you want to be able to, good at drawing people, then you need to draw some more people. If you want to get good at the thing on piano, you got to practice it some more. You know, whatever it is, you get good at what you do. Yeah. Um, and and we we feel like we're supposed to be naturally good at at things that we're that we're meant to do. Right. Yeah. But that's not the case, right? Like I have to write and rewrite and then yeah. I, my editor gets me edits back and I have to rewrite again. And, you know, even though, I mean, I think it's a good book, but it's, you have to work at, at things that you want to do well. Well, and I think sometimes it's when the more you care about it, the harder you are on yourself, because um, I think I've told this story before when I was homeschooling um, my younger daughter, not my younger, my older daughter, um, Emmy, um, was just dissolved in tears one day during her art assignment. And I'm like, why are you crying? I, like the assignment was just to draw her favorite animal. But the example in the curriculum book was Albert Durer's hair. And if you know, you know, you know that, right? The one with like the, you guys know it. I'm trying to show you on the phone. But it's the one where I swear, I think, didn't Albert Durer use like single, oh, like gosh. paintbrushes with one, um, where I think if I you know. look at wow. if you look at the painting, it's just called the young hair, and she was looking at that and she thought her cat had to look like that, and it just mm -hmm. broke my heart. I'm like, no, whatever you come up with is is it comes from you. That's what's important. But um, and then I had I think um, I had a student when I used to teach um, creative writing. I had a student who thought he hated writing. And um, thought he was bad at writing. And I very quickly recognized he was one of the best writers I'd ever had. And um, so I sat him down and I was like, the reason you think you're not good at writing is because you are a writer. And what's coming out is not up to what's in your head. It's your standards are really high. So the end of that story is he is now a journalist. So there you go. But that's amazing. Um, <laughs> but I do. I, are y'all familiar with that yeah. Ira Glass quote about, you know, about, our, I think it's about writing particularly, but like he says that very thing. Like um, there's a point that you get to where um, your skill level and your taste like have a, have a wide yes. gap. And that's when you really need to keep going yes. because you you have the taste to be a writer, mm -hmm. right? And and that will tell you, right, that you're not good enough, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's true because you, the first thing you write is not going to be good enough. Mm -hmm. Your first draft is not good enough, right? right? Um, so you do have to keep pushing and, and growing yeah, and, and practicing. There also seems to be a point yeah, be, yeah. Uh, in addition to that. It's almost running in parallel. That there's the concept of... In order to get good at something, you need to persevere. You need to keep practicing it. You know, have this sort of uh, growth mindset. But there's also the concept where I think a lot of creativity is worthwhile, even if you never get good at it. Um, so, so again, let, let's go to the whittling. I mm -hmm. just started whittling, mm -hmm. so I'm bad at it. But I just started. Like, do I have whittling talent? I don't know. It's possible if I work really hard at whittling, I could get really good at it. Maybe. <laughs> It's also possible that I could keep practicing a lot and I'll Maybe. always be bad at it. I don't know, but I get the feeling that I will still find whittling worthwhile, mm -hmm. even if I know I'm bad at it after years and years of practice, because it's, you know, it gives me this sort of creative outlet. I, mm -hmm. I like the process of there's all these independent reasons 
why it's worthwhile, even if what I'm doing isn't objectively good. Mm hmm. Absolutely. I, actually, it's interesting because there's a scene in the book, one of the characters, Georgia, does pottery, and then she's she's helping six-year-old Lily try to do a pot on the wheel, which is actually much harder than it, it looks. It is so hard. I tried um, one time and... Yeah, I would try. It. Yeah, and it comes out all lopsided when Lily does it, and you know she's she's like, oh, that wasn't what I I thought I was gonna make, and she's like, well, do you want to keep it? What do you want to do? And uh, you know, it, it's true. Like creativity and and doing doing creative stuff is worthwhile no matter what, and it also depends on what your goal is. Is if your goal is to as a creative outlet then it is worthwhile just to to do it. If your goal is to produce something spectacular to give to others, right. To share with the world, then you do need to, to keep going and practice. So it, it's it, creativity is one of those things that it can be a hobby. It can be a profession. It, it should be part of our normal lives, right? There's a million ways to be creative that are not art or music or whatever. It can be the way you style your home. It could be creating a beautiful meal. It could be being a good conversationalist, like thinking of questions to ask a friend like you guys are doing now. <laughs> That's an art, I think, you know? So there's a lot of ways that we use creativity that don't have to be like professional. Yeah. So now let's sort of get to the nuts and bolts of that because, you know, obviously your, your book has that as one of the major themes, but then there's, uh, so that'd be something that, you know, the readers would get, uh, the middle grade readers would get throughout the course. But then there's the other dimension too, where you have the parents, right? The parents who, you know, might buy the book for the kids. And if they're going to buy the book, they probably really value this. So what advice would you have to parents or, you know, like aunts, uncles, folks who, who have uh, kids in their lives in order to help foster a healthy creativity in them? So I think one of the big things here, I have a little rabbit trail. So when my daughter, my oldest <laughs> we like was trails. like, okay. yeah, was like 18 months. Um, she could not sit still for anything. And I would want to try to read her a board book and like, she wouldn't sit still for it. And I was like, she's never going to be a reader. And it was like, felt so tragic. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> and um, I heard some advice to let her see me reading, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> when you model something, kids pick it up, right? And I found this true when I started kind of actively pursuing writing, spending time on it and letting the kids know what I was doing and reading them what I wrote. I saw a big change in how they approached their own creativity because they took their own creativity more seriously and they started writing books for each other and reading them. And they, you know, started doing all sorts of stuff because they were kind of by my modeling were given permission to spend time being creative. Right. It's, you know, I could provide them with all the, the creative stuff, all the art supplies, whatever, but being a model of what that looks like for them was probably the most influential thing as far as what I can see um, that I've been able to do. So modeling creativity would be, would be a big thing. A lot of those parents though are going to be looking at the book and being like, I want my child to learn about art. Yeah. And, <laughs> and yes, this could be a sneaky way to get them to learn about art and maybe become more interested. But then I would love those parents to follow it up by taking their kids to a museum or maybe doing like a simple picture study with their kids at home. I have a resource um, at the restorationist.com, a little um, picture study resource like Charlotte Mason style with a little restorationist twist um, that parents could use. But yeah, yeah, follow it up with some actual art in person. That'd be great. Now, what do you think about like when your kids are doing are creating something like when my daughter was weeping over her not perfect cat? Like um, it, that's such a tricky thing when you're talking to your child about um, about what they've made. What do you do you think there's things you should avoid saying or when in your reaction well, to their I art? Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on the child. Um, I think it's not always helpful to be like, oh, no, it's perfect. It's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, you might because they already can, can see that it's not even if it looks great to you. Like there's obviously something missing in their um, perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe asking some questions like um, 
what were you trying to do? Mm-hmm. Like, what, what are you wanting it to look like? Or can you give me an example? Or, um, you know, what would you do differently if you could draw this again? Mm-hmm. And maybe we should try to draw this again. What if I draw with you? You know, um, depending on the age of the kid, right. obviously. But, you know, I, I think um, trying to give honest praise um, and feedback in the form of a question is usually kind of my my go-to. And it depends on the kid. Yeah. Like if it's a kid who I'm like, y- you are very gifted and you, yeah. <laughs> you maybe are pursuing art. Like maybe I'm going to give you a little bit more feedback if I have it. Right. You know, some, sometimes it's just like, this is amazing. I don't understand how you made this. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, my, um, my younger daughter, sorry, I talk about my kids all the time. I'm not sorry. Never mind. Anyway, my, <laughs> um, my younger daughter is an absolute perfectionist she's not even the one that was crying about the cat um but she is a total perfectionist and everything in school came really easily to her about until she mm. hit mm. chemistry uh, high school um, math's having some school. flashbacks so, too but uh, uh, go zipping. on i know but mm-hmm. now she's a nurse so she figured it out but anyway um <laughs> but the I remember specifically we had a, an art class that we did online and she just sweated over this one. She was supposed to do, in fact, I think it was, it was, it was a um, modeled after a Van Gogh drawing or it might've been Gauguin, which is the bedroom. Is that Gauguin? Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. she was supposed to draw it with a perspective and you know the lines mm-hmm. to make it look like it's mm-hmm. far away and she just wasn't getting it and i think i didn't help enough cuz i didn't realize how um persnickety the online art teacher was going to be but i was horrified <laughs> yeah, because exactly. she might have graded van gogh bad on Remember, that one then too Gogh, but i don't van know van gogh's professor like, that's a little were tough on him off too. with the walls and <laughs> she gave my daughter a zero because what? she made the assumption that she had not spent time on it just because it wasn't good. And so I <laughs> I wrote her a strongly worded email. And I was like, I believe a zero would be she didn't do it at all. Because it totally yeah. tanked her grade. And I'm like, oh my yeah, goodness. it was terrible. So I think it was some brand new teacher. Ooh. So I was like, Ma- Mandy on the warpath. How you deal ah. with second grade. <laughs> Oh, I will. Um, but anyway, but um, but I remember th- like that was just for me to be able to see how hard she worked at it. And then the way it was received by someone who didn't see the process and didn't really care about my child as far as I'm not saying, you know what I mean, didn't didn't think mm-hmm. about um, didn't even ask like, the effect on her. Yeah, she yeah. didn't. So I was thinking like, maybe that's a good thing too. like um, when you talk to your kid about your art, say, you know, did you enjoy the process? So like what you said, Matt, mm-hmm. with the whittling, um, maybe don't only talk about how it turned out, but um, how, how did you feel when you were making this? And um, how much time did you spend? And what were some of the thoughts yeah. you had? And, you know. Yeah. Or even for older kids to ask, do you want feedback on this? Yes. Right. Oh, what a concept. Because uh, <laughs> we definitely, yeah, my, my oldest daughter likes to write mm-hmm. as well. And um, I found as a homeschool mom that I actually could not really give her writing instruction be- because there was too much pressure since I was an author mm. and she wanted to be an author. It, it did not work. Right. <laughs> so I had to back way off. And now that w- really depends on the kid. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to know your kid and your relationship with them. But like definitely asking what kind of feedback are you, are you looking for? Do you want feedback or do you just want to know if I like it? Mm-hmm. You know, like are you, what are you looking for um, in this? And older kids are better at communicating that. Yeah, obviously. definitely. Little ones, they just, they want to, they are wanting time with you. They're wanting you and that's why they're showing you your art their art yeah, and they're right? looking at your face see what i did yes. you know like um yeah. yeah i would do a lot of like oh thing. my gosh this color is so cool you know and look it's very specific mm-hmm. things because i think um to me i think kids really just want to know that they're being seen and so yes. um just talking about the details whether it's a quality assessment or not like what if you yeah, used yellow sure. on the sun blah 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 you know <laughs> or blue <laughs> you made the sun blue that's so cool you know <laughs> because blue is a cool color yeah. oh 
Ooh, punny. <laughs> Let's talk about the. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, so that absolutely seems true, right? Like it depends on who the kid is, how old they are. Like you know, so I, I can even see among my different kids, some are very sensitive to criticism. Some you can sort of give them more blunt feedback, and they can take it in stride. So there's that aspect. And then there's, yeah, are, is this something the kid mm-hmm. is just doing to be creative? Or is it something they are actually serious about and they, they want to advance farther? And that that is a very big thing to try to figure out as a parent <laughs> before you give your feedback. <laughs> it's the difference between, oh, it's so yeah. cool. Yeah. The sun is so yellow <laughs> versus, okay, that's good. Here are a few things maybe you could work on for next uh-huh. time. And that there's a gulf of difference depending on what your kid's expectations are. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think if you're always doing only one or the mm-hmm. other, then that that can be a problem in your relationship with the child. If you're always only saying, this is amazing, this is beautiful, right. and they never feel like there's any anything, <laughs> then they're going to start not trusting you with that, yeah. right? And then also, if you're only like, well, what about this? Well, mm-hmm. what about this? Mm-hmm. Then they're going to think that they all never measure up, yeah. Yeah. right? So it, I think it is important to give like a mix um of, of yeah, I think that's, I really like what you said about asking them questions, because that's one way to gauge, like, um, if you're like, so what, what were you feeling when you made this? I don't know, I was just scribbling, then you don't need to worry about it, you know, and just watch, <laughs> watch their face, like, and it, um, yeah, that's one of the cool things about parenting is really seeing your child's reactions yeah, and awesome. come alive. So this was a very good For discussion sure. <laughs> about an important topic. But now, since we only have a few minutes left in the podcast, I would like trans- to transition to a topic that I care a lot about, but which others may not, and that's fine, and that is the specific rules of the world building. Okay, so let, let me let me give you... Oh, I thought yeah. you were going to say dinosaur. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, so, Carolyn, let, let me explain. Um, I recall, I'm glad you mentioned this, Mandy. First of all, how, what's her name? Is it Cornelia Funka? Funky? Funk? Mm-hmm. Funka? Funka. Okay, thank you. I looked it up on Google Translate. Just for this podcast. So that is kind of So I will say, I never, I, I never read the book, Inkheart, yes. but I did see the movie. And the movie drove There's me nuts three. because I didn't see how the world building worked. If I remember this right, if you read something from a book, it would come alive. And then they're trying to figure out, but it's like, okay, couldn't you just write your own book and read it? And then that would come alive. Are, are there rules here? Like, what, 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 why aren't you doing this? Why do you need to find a picture of Huck Finn, uh, a copy of Huck Finn when you could just write the words? So that drove me nuts. Mandy, did I, did I get in cart wrong? Is, is, is there a better mechanism than that? Um, okay. Confession. I, so. I didn't read them. Emmy read them oh. and just <laughs> ate them up. <laughs> But she would tell me about them. So I have read them. Yeah. It has been a while, but I believe it had more to do with like um, certain people had the ability to read characters out of books, and it they okay. may have needed to be first editions or something like that. Like there was, they were looking for a specific book. Maybe someone had had bought all of them, and they had to find the same book to get the. Um, okay. the villains back or it, to get the mom out right. it's been it, 15 years since I read this but um, I did read it so the, I think the world building was probably better in the book than yeah the, that's the what Emmy okay. from what okay, good, Emmy good. hated the movie and that's let, what let me be clear say. here <laughs> this is not an important thing that that was bothering me this isn't th- th- this doesn't make sense it's just it's just what I was thinking when I was watching the movie it's like because then I the, the big scene at the end the girl realizes wait I can write into the margins here it's like you could have done that at the start uh, but anyway all that is to say, uh, Carolyn, <laughs> walk me through the process of your painting, because I'm very fascinated how this works. Okay, yeah. So um, so certain people have the ability to, we call it, travel into paintings. And they do this by reaching out toward the painting. They technically don't touch it, because you should not touch a painting. Thank you. And I yeah, make that oh a little gosh, bit more clear so all the museums too. would like to but- you. <laughs> If you made them happen. So, um, yeah, uh, you can only travel through a painting that is framed. That's like what's, what creates the doorway. So when Vincent walks into Uncle Leo's house for the first time, there's paintings all over every wall, but none of them are framed, even ones that normally would be, right? Okay. Um, so 
a painting has to be framed to travel through it. That's rule number one. Um, and then uh, rule number two is that the paintings of any certain artist are linked together with a in a dark corridor. Basically, you go into a painting, you kind of exit the painting via either side, and you wind up in the corridor, and then you see all of this long black corridor, and each painting is kind of backlit. Was what you what you perceive, Ooh. and um, <laughs> but if a painting is not framed, it'll still be there in the corridor, and you could travel into the painting, but you can't get from that painting into the real world. Oh, okay. So it has to be framed and and uncovered. Like if you covered it up, you, someone couldn't travel from that painting into the real world. Oh, okay. put it in a box or whatever. Um. So those are some of the major rules. Um. Let's see. What else do you need to know? I mean, th that that's really the <laughs> that's the main rule. Oh, the other rule, uh, uh, not a rule, but um, each person with the ability to travel in the that world can uh, will also have a gift. So um, I can't tell you what Vincent's gift okay. is because that's kind of part of the plot the of the book. book. Um, but Georgia's gift is navigation. So she has all these museums in her head, the layouts, their collections, like she knows what's going on. It's like a huge amount of information. It may not seem that cool, but like based on the amount of research I had to do that just took me hours and hours, she just does it in a second. Oh, go Georgia. Um, <laughs> yeah, go Georgia. She's super cool. Um, so she's a navigator. Uncle Leo is a restorer. So um not only do, is he like an actual art conservator in, in the book, that's a, that's an actual job, but um, the bad guys, the distortionists, they subtly alter paintings from the inside, which affects the way that outside viewers feel when they perceive <gasps> the paintings and can lead to bad consequences. So one of the things that Uncle Leo does is restore paintings um, to get rid of the distortions. So um, other skills in that world, let me think if I can, I have um, appraisers, those come in in the second book, um, and there's artists, and there's maybe going to be another one, but I need to talk to my editor. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so different people have different skills that some are more rare than others. Oh, there's tracker. Mm -hmm. That's the other one. Yeah. Um, so I, you made me think when you talked about the frame, for some reason, in my head, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the opening of Voyage of the Dawn yeah. Treader came to my head. <laughs> um, do they like, because in Voyage of the Dawn Treader, like the painting sort of comes out at the same time. Does that happen in your book or do they go, they just go in? <laughs> well, in the movie, it comes out at the same time. I don't know in the, I in the book if it's wet. really coming out. They see it starting to move, I right? They They're got, like I having they the wet. sensation of it. And Vincent does kind of have that kind of thing okay. happen to him okay. where he's like, I can almost feel the breeze. And he's kind of being like pulled toward a painting right. without even realizing what's happening. Yeah. Um, so yes and no. And it's funny because you bring that up. And that was one of my favorite books as a kid. Oh, yeah. But I didn't even realize that I had done the same kind of concept until someone brought it oh, up like funny. a year or two after I'd written the book. That's my like, favorite. Oh, yeah. That is, that is one of my absolute <laughs> favorite books of all time. And it's definitely. So, my favorite so yeah. first of all, Carolyn, so. well done with the yeah, rules. I, I approve. And uh, listeners will know I care about the rules way too much. Well, yes. while Mandy is plotting like the characterization <laughs> and character arcs of, of her book i'm going through like rules but um Which are so, so tell me so, so tell yeah, me this so it sounds like you go in point. through yeah. like a van gogh all the van goghs are connected you can't get from like a van gogh to a man a right okay so then Not like, unless you hop out into a museum in between so that which is where navigation comes in to play because okay. not so every you, so museum you could go into a Van Gogh in New York also, and come right? out at okay. a Van Gogh in Paris. Okay. So theoretically then right. I could do a painting right. and put a frame on it. You could have all the matte paintings, but they just all be in my house. So it wouldn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So like, <clears throat> So not every painting done by everyone is probably <laughs> like a work of art necessarily. Ah. So, so yeah, <laughs> someone with the skill of an artist, you know, if they, if, uh, so another rule um, is that you're not supposed to travel oh. into artists that are still living because the corridor connecting the paintings Ooh, is, that's a, good is a that's residual a good part of the okay. mind of the I artist. Like oh. And so it messes with stuff if you go into, plus a lot of modern paintings also... <laughs> are not framed 
So oh, that kind of, true. there's no doorway. <laughs> oh, that's totally true. Some of them are not but, framed at all. I wouldn't want to go into that. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe that's why Vincent Van Gogh was confused. <laughs> People were jumping around in his paintings. <laughs> maybe it wasn't the absence. Maybe. It's so many things. It was all those restorationists <laughs> running around in the court. Of the There's a lot of theories with Van Gogh, too, like, that he maybe didn't oh. actually kill himself. I, I find it did. pretty believable, actually. I don't yeah. think he did. I don't think he did either. So, yeah. Or that he maybe didn't even Ooh. cut off his own ear. That made Van Gogh again. So, right. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. we're... We'll never know. I think we, I, we I, may have their next podcast, podcast topic podcasting. now. Um, painting <laughs> detectives. Um, so that is that is some that is a YouTube wormhole I'm about to go down. Uh, but in the meantime, um, we are actually out of time for this right. main po- for this podcast. Uh, so once again, Carolyn Leilaglu, the the book is let's see, it's beneath a swirling sky, right? Did I get all the? Okay. That's right. Beneath the Swirling Sky, it's book one of the Restorationists, and people awesome. can go to the restorationist.com awesome. well, to learn again, more. Thank Woo-hoo! you so much. Really appreciate uh, you joining us here. And listeners, as the rest of you can probably tell, things are winding down at the Anselm Society Digital Pub. The customers are trundling home. The fire is down to embers. You've polished off your final glass. Once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. If you want to find out more about us, maybe visit us at anselmsociety.org. And maybe, if you want to help the show out in a little way, uh, spend the next 15 seconds or so uh, leaving us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next time.